we're scoring about 5% in our test of what's the universe made of. The Bible describes the real world as we know it. It has the ring of truth. What kind of country is it that we live in when you can't tell a child why his father was killed because you didn't want him to grow up hating white people? Does the human race deserve to continue? From the Centre for Public Christianity, you're listening to Life and Faith. I'm Natasha Moore. Earlier this year, Steven Pinker, who is a Harvard psychology professor, released his latest book. It's called Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism and Progress. A lot of the book is made up of these graphs that chart the progress humanity has made across a whole bunch of markers. According to Pinker, pretty much whatever the measure, things are better today than they have ever been before. So I show in about 75 graphs that uh, the world has really been getting better. We live longer, we're less likely to starve to death, to uh, die in a war or an accident or as a crime victim. We have more leisure time, we have more access to culture, we, our attitudes are more tolerant. Uh, anything that you care to measure, as opposed to assessing from the headlines, shows that we've made progress. Pinker's argument and the sheer number of his graphs are pretty compelling. And one of the central claims of his book is that we owe all this to the Enlightenment. Now, this is a word that gets bandied around a bit, but how clear are we on what it actually refers to? And is Stephen Pinker right? Is the human race on an inevitable track onward and upward? Or are we about the same as always, just with a bit more science and technology at our disposal? Someone who was brave enough to debate Professor Pinker publicly in the UK earlier this year is Nick Spencer. He is the research director at Theos Think Tank in London, and he has a few holes to poke in Pinker's onwards and upwards account. So when he was in Sydney recently to deliver our annual Richard Johnson lecture, we got him into the CPX studio to ask him about it. And we started the conversation at what Pinker sees as the fount of progress, the Enlightenment. It's a period roughly coincident with the 18th century in which usually Western European thinkers began to engage with big existential questions from what we would call their secular point of view. And that's a grotesque oversimplification on lots of different levels. And perhaps the most important distinction to make is that there wasn't one thing called the Enlightenment, even though the phrase and the idea dates from the end of the 18th century and an essay by Immanuel Kant, historians identify French, British, American enlightenments, radical and secular enlightenments. There are some who have even talked about a Catholic enlightenment at the same time. So there are lots of different things. They cohere around the idea of, if you like, reason being used to adjudicate on humankind's biggest issues. And it was a good thing? Broadly speaking, yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Why? Um, Because it substituted in many people's minds what had been confessionally limited reasoning for more publicly accessible reasoning. What I mean by that is that heretofore, a lot of thinking about these issues had been hedged in by confessional allegiances, allegiances not just to the Christian faith but to specific positions within the Christian faith. And what the Enlightenment did was question that and open up the debate in such a way as gave freer reign for reasoning and public reasoning that had heretofore been common. Now, that isn't the same as saying, which is what many people say, secular thought replaced religious thoughts. It was much more complex than that. But in as far as it helped expand the horizons of public reasoning, and it did so, broadly speaking, in a peaceful way, that's a good thing. So there are some things that we can trace now back to the Enlightenment that we can be grateful for? There are, although, and this is one of my big contentions, the Enlightenment was not ex nihilo. It didn't emerge out of absolutely nothing at all. And that, I think, is one of the big errors that is often made when secular-minded thinkers are thinking about the Enlightenment. They will root our modern virtues and political and intellectual commitments to Voltaire or Kant or, perhaps less likely, Rousseau or David Hume or whatever it is and ignore virtually everything that goes before them and 
commonly rubbish the things that went before them. So up until that point, mankind is in his tutelage. He's in his intellectual infancy. And, and this is an idea that actually gets directly from Kant. The Enlightenment is a direct coming of age. My argument is more that what we see in the 18th century is the assembly of a lot of jigsaw pieces, if you like. And much of what Enlightenment thinkers engaged with existed in theory and often in practice in various different parts of, again, usually Western European culture. So it's an important period, but it doesn't come out of nowhere. What are some other things that people get wrong about the Enlightenment? What other myths do we have? Let me take one. The idea that democracy is an Enlightenment idea or that democratic thinking didn't exist in any way, shape or form before that. That's erroneous in two regards. The first is that democracy in and of itself isn't a particularly Enlightenment-rooted idea. A lot of Enlightenment thinkers were profoundly anti-democratic for the simple reason that if you believe society can be designed and ordered along lines of reason, you don't want the great unwashed to get in the way of that. You know, as an Enlightenment philosopher, that there are certain ways in which society should be structured. More pleasure and happiness over pain and unhappiness. You know what the balance is, you know what the calculus is there. Well, don't let the the, the, the unreasoning masses get in the way of that. Now, of course, there are ideas of political accountability in Enlightenment. Not all Enlightenment thinkers are anti-democratic in that sense. But to root the ideas of democracy in Enlightenment thought is to pay insufficient attention to Enlightenment thought. And, my second point, to pay insufficient attention to various democratically inclined ideas that existed beforehand. So where does democracy come from, if not from the Enlightenment? Well... It comes from the idea of political accountability and what legitimises political authority. If you're in power, you have to be accountable. Who are you accountable to? Well, within the Christian tradition, it is, of course, God. But more specifically, it's towards a certain idea of public justice, which is defined according to God's law. However, From quite an early stage, I remember reading an Anglo-Saxon sermon from the 10th century when this absolutely jumped out at me. From quite an early stage, there are some thinkers who have the idea that that concept of justice has to integrate what the people themselves think is their own good. And in this sermon from from Alfric in the 10th century, he writes, a people can have the right to choose the king that reigns over them, but after they've chosen him, they have to accept him. Similar ideas emerge, particularly in the what we would anachronistically call the non-conformist tradition in the 17th century, which has its roots in certain congregational forms of worship where the congregation shapes and orders the leadership of its congregation. Well, if you do that within a congregation, why not do that with an entire political system? And famously, during the Putney debates in, the mid, in, the, in 1647, one Thomas... Rainsborough, Colonel Thomas Rainsborough, says that everyone in England, even the poorest he, should have the right to choose and shouldn't live in a system in which they cannot choose someone who reigns over them. So there are democratic ideas that rest in this concept of political accountability and what public justice is. Very important caveat to say that if you were to canvass ecclesiastical opinion at any time up to and including the late 19th century it would probably be pretty undemocratic. But that doesn't mean the ideas weren't there in some form beforehand. So why do you think those narratives are so popular? So this particular one that's been coming up a lot of, you know, yay, the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment gave us everything that's worth having. Why do you think that narrative is so appealing? Well, I think there is um, specific contemporary reasons for that at the moment. It's not as if thinkers of say, 60 or 70 years ago, thought the Enlightenment was a load of nonsense or an irrelevance and we shouldn't talk about it. Of course not. They took it for granted. We can no longer take it for granted today. And I suspect one of the reasons why there is this increasing emphasis on it is because one of the, if you like, accepted ambitions and hopes of the Enlightenment was that reason, 
was so self-evidently true that human societies would naturally progress in such a way as to become demonstrably more rational and therefore happier and more contented and more peaceful as a result. And in particular, and this was a big Enlightenment theme, religion would simply wither on the vine. Well, it didn't quite turn out like that. And I suspect what we see both in the last 10 years and then more broadly the last 40 years and is the reintroduction of religion sometimes very viscerally into the public forum and an awareness that democracy and the choice of the people doesn't always cash out in the most rational or even the most peace-oriented policies. And all of a sudden, there's a fear that Enlightenment values are going to be thrown out the window, so therefore we go back to the Enlightenment and preach it very vociferously. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. The hope of the Enlightenment is a bright one, that more rational societies would naturally be happier, more peaceful and more moral ones. But the reality of the Enlightenment is a different story. Nick Spencer says there's a dark side to all this. Some scholars have gone so far as to draw a direct line from the Enlightenment to some of the most horrific events of modern history, such as the Holocaust. But as with everything, it's easy and tempting to oversimplify. Surprise, surprise, the reality turns out to be more complicated. The beef I have with Stephen Pinker is that he traces all good things to the Enlightenment and no bad things to it. And as soon as you do that, I think you're almost invariably oversimplifying history for your own purposes. Specific example... Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, is a quintessential Enlightenment thinker. He has no time for metaphysics, no time for certainly theology in any sense that we would understand it. You make society better through the exercise of reason and counting. More pleasure, less pain. That is becomes utilitarianism. That becomes very influential in the early 19th century. And it underpins certain laws such as, for example, the Anatomy Act of 1832, in which it's legislated that the bodies of paupers who are too poor to pay for their own funeral can legitimately be used for medical experimentation. Now, on utilitarian grounds, that makes absolute sense. You're not causing any pain to a body because it's already dead, and you're going to generate pleasure because through testing that body, you will get medical knowledge that will help living people. Utilitarian-wise, it makes absolute sense. But, of course, we abhor it. And there's something profound in that that is very discomforting, that we should somehow treat the bodies of dead, poor people differently than we would do if they were dead, rich people, that we should experiment on the poor when we treat the rich in a very different way. Similarly, and more famously, it's that kind of utilitarianism that goes into generating the new poor laws with their workhouses, with the idea that you make welfare, in inverted commas, so very, very miserable and very tough that only the most destitute are going to go for it. Again, you're minimising pain in theory and maximising pleasure. The result is Oliver Twist and Charles Dickens. So this isn't to say, and I wouldn't go as far as some... 20th century critics to say there's a direct line between, if you like, the Enlightenment, its instrumentalisation of reason and the Holocaust. I think that's overplaying the hand. But it's undoubtedly the case that rationalism, however you define that, is not the same as morality. So is it that we make a lazy equivalence between Enlightenment and humanism? It is. And here is a second beef I have with Stephen Pinker. (laughs) The idea that he argues that humanism, however that's defined, and we might come on to that, is rooted in the Enlightenment is, I think, actually just straightforwardly ignorant. Humanism is understood today often in an anti-religious sense because it's been hijacked by an anti-religious lobby and used to put forward secular views. Properly speaking, it's a deeply Christian doctrine and... I define it, and I'm conscious that different people define it in different ways, as having a recognition of the intrinsic value 
and equality of the human. Well, if it is defined that way, there is absolutely no doubt that it pre-exists enlightenment by centuries, arguably by millennia. If we want to look at the shape of our society and how the Enlightenment has kind of impacted that and we downplay or forget about Christianity as a piece of that puzzle, how big a deal is that? How big a missing piece is it? Historically, it's a very big missing piece. I think the more interesting question is what does it mean for how we navigate society today? I know people who are perfectly happy to acknowledge the Christian influence and significance on Enlightenment thinking, but then say, it doesn't really matter. Christianity might have generated or at least provided some of the framework for what we call the Enlightenment, but we are where we are now, and you no longer need those Christian foundations to sustain Enlightenment thinking. It's very difficult to answer that directly because, in a sense, you don't know where we're going to be in 200 years' time. I would say there's something in that argument, but nothing like as much as they think. So take, for example, science. Now, science originated before the Enlightenment in lots of different areas, but specifically in the scientific revolution of the 17th century. But it's affirmed and encouraged and oriented and pushed on its way by the 18th century. There are very good arguments, and and, and Peter Harrison here in Australia has made them more convincing than anybody else, I think, that the scientific revolution is rooted quite profoundly in the Christian worldview. Does that mean that science is no longer going to continue if society becomes more secular? I, I suspect it doesn't. I suspect there is a momentum to the scientific method, an internal coherence and logic, which means that were society to completely secularise, and as an aside, I don't think it will in any way, shape or form, but were it to, there's an internal logic and coherence that keeps it going. You can't guarantee that because there were certainly problems in Soviet Russia with regards to ideology imposing its direction on science. That just shows that science is vulnerable to any kind of pressured ideology. But I think there's an internal momentum to the practice of science. If you change the discussion to something like humanism, I think that becomes much more questionable. And I think you require some profound metaphysical roots to sustain a belief in humanism and the innate dignity and indeed even innate rationality of humans. And I suspect that if you were to ignore Christianity, that wouldn't simply be an historical problem, but it would be a forward-looking problem because nature abhors a vacuum, particularly when it comes to thinking about human nature. And if you don't have those Christian foundations about why all humans, irrespective of their capabilities, have a value, you end up orienting yourself to maybe something like a, a Benthamite, utilitarian anthropology, which says, yes, we do value humans, but we value pay, a pleasure over pain, happiness over misery, and that means that we favour certain policies, which, as we've just discussed, could mean degrading certain kinds of humans because they're not particularly important. And John Evans, an American academic, has done extensive research on the relationship between people's implicit anthropologies, how they understand the human, and their view of certain ethical practices, whether that's, say, the torture of prisoners or the military intervention to prevent genocide and that kind of thing. And he shows quite conclusively that if you hold, a, if you like, a nakedly evolutionary anthropology, humans are nothing more than evolved animals, you're inclined towards a view that is non-humanistic. So I don't want to be apocalyptic at all, and I think that's a mistake that Christians sometimes fall into. But to my mind, it's pretty clear that if you want a robust humanism, you need to root it in Christian thought. So there was this video that did the rounds a couple of years back. You might have seen it. The premise of the video is that it's the 9th of December, 2016. You might remember 2016. This guy wakes up and he's been asleep since New Year's Eve, 343 days. His friend is waiting for him in a random field, wearing a bowler hat for some reason and drinking tea. And he proceeds to fill him in on what he's missed so far that year. First, the good news, if you're a Brit anyway. 
Andy Murray won Wimbledon and became world number one. London elected Sadiq Khan, its first Muslim mayor. Bob Dylan, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Tiger numbers have risen for the first time in a century. And Team GB came second in the Olympic Games. And then, the not so good news. His friend starts on a list of people who died. Bowie, Rickman, Wogan, that's January. February, Umberto Eco, Harper Lee, Sir George Martin, Johan Cruyff, Gary Shandling, Dame Zaha Hadid and Sir Ronnie Corbett. I'm in April now. Vesca, guest, Prince. Prince Andrew! No, he's not dead. Come on! They discuss Brexit. I always want to spend a year in Spain. Well, if you want to do that, you better be quick about it, because we're leaving the EU. We didn't. We did. Why? And the then newly elected US president. You don't know who Donald Trump is? No, well, I, I assume he's a politician of some kind. No. I know he works in property. Property? He got voted in because he's good at building stuff. Walls, specifically. This video was playing on an idea that was current at the time, in some circles. This sense that 2016 was the worst year ever. Every day we saw in the news war, terror, violence, inequality, shock political upsets. And quite a few people started doubting the idea that the world is inevitably getting better. But Steven Pinker is a fierce defender of progress. I have found that intellectuals hate progress. <laughs> and intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. That was from his recent TED Talk, where he argues that the numbers, the raw data, the facts, still show that the world is becoming a better place. So is it? When you read Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, you certainly get the impression it's written of a certain culture and time, America in the early 21st century, in which I think he has two particular enemies in his sights, although he's not quite as specific as to admit it. I think the first is, if you like, the phenomenon that brought Donald Trump to power. It's populist democracy. And the second is, if you like, a kind of extreme version of East Coast liberalism, which sees an absolute equality and parity in all cultures and at all times, usually brackets, apart from the culture that it doesn't like, and therefore eschews the idea that one culture is better than another culture, one intellectual framework is better than another, and of course one intellectual position is more progressed, has gone further, is better than others. So I, I think, he ha I think his, 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 his desire to defend progress is animated by two different phenomena or schools of thought that, for different reasons, dismiss the idea of progress. Do you think, because, I mean, we sort of have this sense of, well, for technology and for science, it's sort of all onwards and upwards. We, we have this sense still that progress is the only direction for that. Um, and therefore we can kind of imagine that, well, life is better now than it was 100, 200, 300 years ago for most people. So maybe moral and social progress works the same way. At the same time, we have, you know, these apocalyptic stories that we're obsessed with. Um, we worry as a culture that things are actually maybe just around the corner going to get suddenly a whole lot worse. How do those things fit together? Mm. Do you think? I think that, that goes right to the north of the issue. And disambiguating different kinds of progress is really important. On the one hand, I think, you know, only a fool would argue that we haven't made technological progress or indeed scientific progress. On the other, I think that to naturally mean that that means we have made social and moral progress is much more questionable. We are, if you like, the same species but with bigger sticks. Hmm. And those sticks can be used to reach further and achieve more, but they can conversely be used to beat a lot more people. And that is precisely the point. I think that were we to uh, find ourselves under the same pressures of resource scarcity that our ancestors endured every single day, we would probably find ourselves less moral than we think ourselves to be. And I think that's a critical difference. It doesn't mean that we are more moral than people who lived two or five or even ten generations ago. I think there are fewer pressures on us to be immoral. So do you 
subscribe to the idea that really humans are kind of the same in all times and places, more or less. Human nature doesn't change. What do you reckon? I do subscribe to that view. I've got to be conscious that even as my best friends tell me, I'm probably more of a glass half empty kind of a person. <laughs> and so I could be speaking entirely from you know that position in my heart. But I did put this point to Pink when I, when I debated him, that putting aside the effect of the incarnation and revelation of God and the love of Christ and how that does transform people. Putting that aside, if you don't have that, if you don't have that fundamentally Christian view of how human lives and by association human societies can be transformed, not necessarily inevitably, but they can be transformed, what have you got to go on? Can you really just dismiss 300 million years of evolutionary history that have created the kind of species that they are. And then imagine that in two or three or four thousand years, that can be completely transformed. I think that is really trying to haul yourselves up by your kind of Darwinian brute straps, <laughs> really. So I happen to hold both those views. I would be a fully paid up Christian theist and a fully paid up evolutionist. And I believe that the redemptive love of God can transform our inner moral compass. But nonetheless, I think that inner moral compass points in a certain way. And Christians would use the words of sin and selfishness for that. You don't have to use those particular words to recognise that there is a self-orientation that we inherit from our evolutionary history that is not readily changed just because we've got the latest model of iPhone. Can you sum up for us, what is the Christian view of progress? I guess the first thing I would say is that it's ambiguous. Sorry to be, <laughs> to caveat everything I say and to footnote everything I say, but it's really important. I think that the human person has a malleability, a creative fluidity to it, which means we are not simply set on the same set of train tracks that are permanent and immovable and take us to a pre-programmed future. The person is responsive to love. And I think, therefore, the person can be redeemed through responding to the love of God. And that means the person's future can be redeemed and can progress. And I'll put that in inverted commas. It can blossom and flourish in a way that it might not otherwise. However, our orientation towards ourself and our self-interest and my good, sometimes my good over and above and at the expense of your good, is nonetheless a pretty strong pull. And therefore, we should never assume, even for those, sadly, especially for those sometimes, who have recognised and embraced and tried to follow the love of God, that that pull of the self is somehow always and totally overcome. Progress, therefore, I suppose, is possible, but certainly not necessary. And we can extrapolate that out to societies as well. Then. And I think that's precisely the point. You know, you can, if that's, if that's the, the, the complex battle that's going on in every individual heart, let's multiply it by the 40 or so million people that live here or the 7 billion or so people that live in the world. It means that within that, you can certainly see an enormous potential for human moral progress. But you have that twin fear of technological progress that seems to continue apace with a more ambiguous form of moral progress that may or may not progress. And I think the worst situation, and this is something that Arthur Kerstler wrote about 70 or 8 years ago, vis-à-vis -vis what happened in the 1930s and the 1940s, the worst possible scenario is a coincidence of significant human technological progress and development with moments of human fallibility. And if you get that, which is classically what you did get in the 30s and 40s, the scene is not a happy one. I'm certainly not optimistic, but I, I probably would be hopeful. And I guess I would be hopeful because of, uh, because of my faith, rather than because of anything intrinsic or obvious within human nature. 
I think there are certain struggles, and you know we've seen this in particular in the last you know five or ten years or so, where I think let's call, trust. I think is a good way of summarising it. We are properly sceptical of authority. And that is one of the, I think, um, things of which Western culture should be proud of. But it has certainly, I think, in the last generation or so, tipped over into cynicism and a ubiquitous cynicism at that at anyone who exercises authority over anybody else. Now, it seems a liberating thing. I trust myself. I don't trust others who have power over me. But that's not how a peaceful or satisfactory society is meant. We need bonds of trust, and not only bonds of trust with our immediate peers and our friends and our family. We need bonds of trust to sustain the institutions that keep society functioning. So in that regard, I'm not a hopeful person because of where we are at the moment, because I think, as I said, we have an unhealthy level of cynicism in that regard. But I think increasingly we recognise that and we recognise that locating all our hopes in the individual and all our, if you like, ideas for the functioning of society simply in the irrational, choice maximising, happiness maximising individual, quite an enlightened idea as it happens doesn't satisfy and that we increasingly recognise the need for relational health, let's put it that way, which means bonds of trust within society. I think that is increasingly on the agenda and that itself is a positive sign. So I I certainly wouldn't be complacent, partly, as I said, because I'm such a glass half empty person, but I would be hopeful that there are signs that we want to reappropriate the kind of trust and the kind of self-giving, I think, that genuinely makes for a really flourishing life. From the Centre for Public Christianity, you've been listening to Life and Faith with Natasha Moore. We've got a few interviews with Nick Spencer available on our website. There's this interview with Simon on how politicians have used and abused the parable of the Good Samaritan. If the labour use of the parable to justify bombing Syria is somewhat extreme, the Thatcherite use to justify materialism and voluntarism is also stretching it a bit. And this conversation on the evolution of the West and Christianity's role in it. The idea of who the human is, a someone rather than a something. A someone, irrespective of the fact they may not be able to afford a mirror to look into in the morning. They are not self-evident ideas. And it was the incursion of Christianity into what we call now the classical world that brought about ideas that in engaging with human beings, you are in some way engaging with a bit of God. For more conversations on life and faith, look us up in your podcast app. Next week... Uh, My main job is to make sure the wings don't fall off. If the wing falls off, it's a bad day. If the wing stays on, it's a good day.